I'm going to talk about infrastructure. This is important for people who are going to build their own pods versus people who are going to get them from us. Remember how I mentioned that there's a delicate balance of aerobic and oxygenation and moisture? The little baby pods that we have, which are basically practice so you can become comfortable with this species, are really turnkey and they're designed to make it easy for you to learn about this species. I'm going to flip this up so you guys can see it. Does everybody see sort of down there there looks like a little reservoir at the bottom? Mm -hmm. That's where the liquid collects. You never ever want to have food scraps or your active pod pooling in liquids. You're going to cause smell and it is going to smell the high heaven. So the goal of our technology is to separate out the liquids. And what we do is we have a perforated drainage plate and you can get any type of polypro material if you're doing to do it yourself and just drill as many holes. You keep the food and active pile above it, let the liquids go through. It's a great way to separate it out easy and in an affordable way. I also use um, this type of thing. It comes with it. It's just a mesh that sort of helps. You remember how um, Taylor mentioned, imagine if there was a layer of woody material on below, the, adding the oxygen and adding air, uh, aerobic condition. This is really good at bringing in oxygen to the lower levels because it's very porous. This only lasts a year. What you could do after the first year is use, I think you guys have all seen this, uh, coir, coconut husk. This stuff is, is a really great media for putting uh, food scraps on because the liquid drains through and there's a lot of oxygenation allowed to come up into it. And it's only lasts a year. It, Five degrades after time, they're not going to eat it, but it is a great material. Every farm should have a roll of this because this stuff is just great for a multitude of uses. I have this up at the farm and I use it for uh, certain hanging baskets and other types of things where I want people to uh, think that I actually have an, an ornamental side to me too. So I try to put a few flowers in now and then. And it's just, you know, you just soften up your style. It can't all be, uh, you Farmscape know. Farmscaping, you need flowers. Right, exactly. It can't all just be comfrey. Um, anyway, so the food scraps would just go right on top, just right on top of the mesh, just dump it in, make sure it's moist. Now when you start off a unit, there's no black soldier fly in there. Now maybe you were like Brian Rosa and you thought ahead and you did a little egg sequestration and you have a thing with eggs in, <laughs> just throw it in. That's going to be great to start off your pod because you don't have to wait till females are going and you've already, already attracted them in the cardboard thing. And I, did, I was passing that around, I don't know where it is, but uh, Go ahead, throw it. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah, so this would have been uh, collecting eggs. I would just do, dump it in with the food scraps. They'll hatch out. They'll be fine. Um, what I do on new startups over the last year or two, and this is new for us, I get, uh, let's see where some are. You know what? I guess I could just bring this out. All right, burlap. Again, something you should have at the farm. There's a multitude of uses. You could also use coffee bags or potato sacks or sometimes burlap. What I do is I cut a piece about the size of here and I just blanket it like a little blanket. You think, okay, what the heck is there a reason to put burlap in a pod for? Over the top? Not on top of the unit, on top of the food scrap. So yeah. directly touching. Well, there's a, a it's multi-beneficial, number one. Taylor, you remember how I said the females don't lay eggs on the food scraps? Well, you just created a lot of surfaces right adjacent to the food scraps. So you pick up the burlap, you notice there's egg sacs all over it. So it's a great egg laying spot. Remember what I said about house flies? They lay it right on the food scraps? Well, if you block the food scraps with a piece of burlap, you just really pissed off a lot of house flies. So you automatically blocked and mitigate. Now, they'll still get through, some of them, but not all of them. What else does it do? Cuts down in the light so that they're feeding in all the vertical columns up at the top where the new fresh stuff is. You don't want that food scraps up at the top to desiccate and form a crust because you're going to prevent oxygen from getting in uh, and it's just going to be problematic. So that little blanket of burlap, and you can even put two pieces of burlap if it has an open weave, is going to allow the moisture and humidity and the, the the, prevent desiccation of, of the food scraps. Because remember, you've just added food scraps, you don't have a colony yet. It's not going to get eaten in one to two days. It ne and it could definitely potentially get crusty. So this burlap helps to mitigate the problems associated with the new setup. 
Now, can you keep doing this throughout the year? Well, it's going to break down, so you can come up and cut another piece. But um, it actually is beneficial throughout the year, I've noticed. So it just, I think it prevents crusty foods from happening. But you have all those other things about, you know, cuts down on the light. And it helps with the house fly and then egg laying spots. So here, Brian, here's one open. What weave would you say that you Pretty have? open weave. That's an open weave. It's going to, it's almost too open in my opinion. Because if you look at a burlap sack, you know how the weave is a lot, is a lot denser. Um, you could actually just take like two of it and double it and fold it on, on itself. And that would be pretty good. But uh, now, okay, you got your food scraps in there. You either got eggs or you're attracting eggs. Remember, smelly foods, not rotten foods, smelly foods are what's going to attract them. And we went over that already. Um, usually, the first two to two and a half weeks are house flies, fruit flies. At about the two and a half week spot, that's when you start seeing grub activity, unless you've introduced it with your little, you know, stash of eggs. Um, then you're going to get them quicker. But that's the point where you start seeing the food scraps really disappear. That's when you know, okay, I need a source of food scraps, especially on the big one. You know, I mean, one bucket gets eaten very, very quickly. So that's when you start feeding it. Feeding it, make sure to learn about the moisture balance, understand about the, the ventilation. If you detect smell, what are you going to do? You're going to try and fluff it up and aerate it. And Break it up. There's a pocket of anaerobicity in there. Something's going on. Break it up. If it's really, really moist, like gelatinous, introduce maybe a little bit of paper or some dried food scraps, like stale Lucky Charms, which you shouldn't be buying anyway. <laughs> but, uh, or, um, I don't, I would not put straw in. It's going to, it's going to put, too much bulk, and then you're going to fill up the volume of a baby pod. So there's always a dried food scrap somewhere in the house Dryer that's stale. Would work maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something dry. I mean, you know what I do? My sister is one of those people that buys prolific food scraps, and then they just, she always has food waste. She's like a typical American. And so I just take all of the expired dried foods in her pantry, and I just fill up a giant bin every time I go up there. And I have that in um, um, sort of a tin bucket, and it's covered. And every time I need dried feed stock, I just shovel it up. And it's a mixture of stale oatmeal and just everything dry, stale chips. And uh, save it. Don't waste anything. Think of it as a resource. If it's overly dry, what are you going to do with those scraps? Hydrate them, OK? So get a spray bottle if you have a grub bin. If your unit's too dry and the, the black ones that are mature are not crawling off, start spraying and moisten. Okay. Now these grubs can crawl up vertically if it's overly humid and overly moist in here. But the good thing is we have a top barrier grub lip that they'll just basically circumvent until they eventually fall in the slit and they fall out here. Now this is deliberately loose so that there's ventilation, there's convection currents that go on, and you have to have it loose. And if not, you'll suffocate the unit. But the, these small pods are so small, there's not, it's not as critical uh, for, uh, for maintaining aerobic conditions. Again, this just pivots so that you could dump food scraps. This is if you need to get in. It actually pivots that way. And uh, it's really basic. This is a really good starter unit. Again, you're only going to feed about three to five chickens, um, but you can feed a couple dozen tilapia with one of these. You can feed several hundred tilapia with that. You look at the amount of food that it feed the average tilapia, and then you calculate what app, based on the 20% bioconversion, you're going to do really well. Um, let's talk now about the big, did anyone have questions on the baby pod? It's pretty, pretty turnkey self-explanatory. Well, my question, which is going to be applied to both, is how much food do you put in at first? Oh. When do you first, when do you add food after? Good, so smart. I'm so sorry. This is about four to five pounds of food scraps a day when it's up and running, okay? But for starters? For starters, I would put in maybe about the same for starting. Four or five pounds and then wait till you see activity? Yeah, and I would make sure it's moist, overly on the moist side, because remember, no activity, you get dryness and desiccation and evaporation, so you want to make sure the original startup is a little bit moister. Um, because of the evaporation. Remember, there's nothing in there eating it. It can dry out really quick. So, okay. That's what happened in there. All right, and so this is great because I can ask you the questions that I wish I could have asked while I was trying to do this, right? You so you have it there, and they're not showing up. We had a really cold spring. 
the soldier flies were real late to even come out and show up. Yeah. So we're sitting there waiting for them to show up. That food is changing. So then when do you decide to add more? When it starts getting down. So when it but starts disappearing down, but it's changing and starting to rot, yeah. let's say. Throw it in the compost bin and just and add more fresh. Yeah, okay. yeah. So you start if it's it. crusty and digested and you'd neglect it because all your soaps are on and you're trying to catch up, you don't even waste your time. Just dump the crusty stuff out. I mean, it's like brick. It's like hard charcoal, brick hard. I mean, that crusty Our food. Moldy. Yeah, it's just it's not even worth your time. I don't think they're ever going to eat it because moisture is never going to re so really keep infuse it, fresh it again. You see activity. Yeah, okay. yeah, and keep it. That's why I start with really moist material when I start a unit. Pet kibble stays moist. It's really good at hydrating mm -hmm. and feed, feed corn too. Yes, ma'am. What happens when they starve? If you don't have enough. They're skinny. What happens when you don't feed them enough and they starve? They're skinny. But don't they die or leave? Or I think they slow down, but it takes a lot to kill these. Oh, good. It really does. They're <laughs> really, I mean, I have kept them in places that you wouldn't think any life form could live. And I'm just like, oh, look, there's still grubs there. So uh, it's, not, it's not because I deliberately want to give them a bad environment. I just ADHD. I forget where things are. Uh, you know, it's like, it's why I can't watch TV because I never know where the remote is. I have no idea. So I can't, I can't own a TV. <laughs> there was a research paper I read where somebody tried them and they submerged them in isopropyl alcohol, I think, for six hours. And? And they were not dead. Really? Yes. I haven't heard that. There, it's that's a, why they're a good fish food, because they live for many hours wiggling in the water. They don't, they don't die immediately, so the fish eat them completely. You can get a complete feed off of them. Bob, I'm so, I'm so glad you mentioned that, and I'm really, really embarrassed that I forgot this, because I'm a fisherman. These are great for anglers. Holy smokes. Not only do you take handfuls and whip them out into the pond to just get the frenzy going, but you put them on the hook and they don't break or fall apart like, like worms. So it's fun to fish with these. My little niece, she only visits me because of my grubs. <laughs> and she's like, mommy, can we go out and look at the grubs? My, Bob, my sister has a sort of a, an, an upchuck reaction when we mention the grubs, but my niece loves them. All kids love this. And you know what, from an education standpoint, you show a kid a compost bin, they're like, oh yeah, eight to 10 weeks, that's exciting. You know, microbes, you, you, you have them digest this down in a couple hours. They are really into science and they're into environment and they're into just all that is good about the planet. And it's a great way to get them invite, you know, interested and get them away from like pursuing like law as a profession, you know, get them into this stuff. You'll, you'll be glad you did so. There's nothing wrong with making them interested about the natural world. And grubs, are, aren't they a great way to do that too? Frogs will eat these. Yes, absolutely. If you take the, the finished grubs and you just throw them out to your bullfrogs, you'll actually see them chase them, the bullfrogs. It's awesome. I have, I have a couple frogs that live over near some wetlands on my property. And if I throw the, the, a handful of grugs, they actually start hopping over to where I dump it. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's great. It's awesome. So, uh, you know, we actually were approached by a bullfrog farmer uh, to, for pods. Yeah, if you tip. feed it perfectly the right amount, are you going to get more grubs or they're just going to put on weight faster? The females are attracted to a colony in addition to being attracted to food scraps. Remember how we talked about the effluent, how there's odors associated with? So the odors of the food scraps, the odors of the effluent, the odors of an active, properly functioning pod attract pregnant females. So a colony attracts more colonies. So if you have a lot more food scraps, you can continue to magnify it. Again, you're limited on volume here and size, but in something like this, you can get a, a grand slam size colony growing. It's just so much fun. I have some videos I wish I could show you where there's just tens of thousands of seeming churning in, in the pile. It is so much fun. And uh, you just have Ziplocs full of finished grubs. It's so much fun. I have friends who only visit me now because of grubs. And I know, I know, I think they're coming to see me, but when they have like a Ziploc sticking out their back pocket, I know what their true intentions are. It's just, it's hurtful, but it like, it, you know, I get to see them, and that's important. Yeah, Edward. What are you using the Ziplocs for? Are you actually storing these? Can you freeze these? <laughs> carrying them around. I usually carry them around that way. 
you can freeze them. I, I rinse them first of our particulates before I clean them or before I freeze them. So I would fill the whole Ziploc with the black and then I rinse it, turn it over, and then I, I, I keep a little bit of liquid in the Ziploc and then freeze it in the whole bag just like it's next to the kale or it's next to the shiitake mushrooms. It's just in the freezer. And uh, the great thing about it is there's a lot of production in the late summer, early fall. So you have bounty, bountiful crawl off. Just save it for the winter. It's a good snack for your birds or your, your fish. So and, you know, what else are you going to do with Ziplocs? Now, they don't live. You're, you're, they, they, they're sacrificed when they fr freeze. But um, <laughs> all the goodness is still there. All right, Pat, I need you here with me. Okay. Here's the monster pod. This is about four to five of these little baby ones. So remember how we said four to five pounds of food scraps a day? 20 to 25 pounds of food scraps a day. Basically, a five-gallon bucket is probably easily digested every day. What I want to do is go over the infrastructure of this because this is not turnkey like the baby pod. This is a lot of do-it-yourself stuff and you have to create some infrastructure around it. All we provide you is the body and a well-written manual with a couple illustrations. But um, what I'm going to do is Pat and I are going to tip this for you so you can see it and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the materials. Uh, let's bounce it up there so I... Okay, this is about 24 pounds, so it's very lightweight. It's just cumbersome. Does everybody see sort of the, the cross down there? That's, that's, this is raised so that these areas are lower. That's where the liquids are going to pool. So what you want to do is I would take a half inch drill bit, drill maybe eight to ten holes in the different things because you want redundancy with drainage. You never want to let liquids pool and they will block up. So create some extra. Why don't go bigger than a half inch? If it's more than a dime, the rodents will get in. So nothing more than a dime diameter, okay? Um, what I would do after I drill some holes is I'm gonna put some gravel in, okay? Do it up to the threshold, which is the top of here, okay? So you basically fill the four quadrants with the gravel and any, any agricultural gravel is fine, just something yeah, that's gravel. not reactive. Go ahead, let's... Then what we're going to do is we are going to elevate it. So pick it up a little bit. I would say elevate it on uh, concrete blocks about that high. Okay. The reason is you don't want to ever let this lay on the ground because those holes can clog and back up. Because there's a lot of particulates going through with the effluent. Right, Mary? And they can clog up. And you never, ever, ever want to let liquids back up in there because it'll stink to high heaven. So the elevation helps with... Um, also thermal balance, because these can get extremely warm. It'll be 75 out here. You measure the temperature, it's 95 in the pod. Having it off the ground sort of gives it some thermal um, separation and it doesn't, it doesn't hold the, the heat as much. Now it, it back, it, it's backwards and when it starts to get cool like in November, so you can take an old army blanket, maybe an old wool army blanket from the army navy store and wrap it around the base. That'll help maintain some of the heat from a, like a thermal mass standpoint. But anyway, so we're going to elevate these on concrete blocks. I would do three or four. You just don't want it to fall off. And then underneath, what I would do is I would do mulch. What I wouldn't do is put it on a, a solid surface. Why? You never want to let the liquids pool. Why? Because the females are attracted to the liquid. If you created a pool of liquid down there, they're going to start laying eggs down there. You don't want that. You want it up here. So don't let your liquids pool. Let it drain into the mulch below. And it will do that in any type of mulch. What we have found is that there's a couple people who are experimenting with biochar and they're putting that in the mulch. So they're mixing biochar and mulch together. And what's happening is the effluent, which is microbially active and microbially rich and nutrient rich, is infusing and imprinting into the biochar a lot of microbial yeah, it's, it's the first colonization. It's not yep. the ideal microbes, but then if you mature it or put it with compost or something, the ideal microbes will move into it. You're right. Charging. You're above, the nutrient charge is there. You're getting the early colonization, and other microbes will do better, the ones that are in the soil and stuff. So when it goes in the soil, they'll, 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 they'll take over. Yeah, and then, so... Do you use it just charged, or you compost it? 
you can do either. Just if, once again, if it's if it's effluent, <laughs> treat it with raw manure as far as the organic standards and food safety standards go. 120, if a crowd's going to touch it. 90, if it's not going to touch it. Yeah. I save about a mason jar worth of the liquid effluent. Just make sure it's a wide mouth. Has everyone froze a mason jar that's not wide mouth? So do it. Make sure it's wide mouth, uh, or you're going to just cause trouble. Um, that's all I need for attracting it in the spring. But um, oh, another thing is, you know those the cardboard briquettes that we talked about. Um, you can actually put some of the liquid on that too. That works really well. I forgot to mention that. It's just a little trick we've learned. Okay, so we talked about the drainage holes. We talked about the gravel. On top of the gravel, I would put this. And I think you've all seen this. This is just a uh, weed barrier, landscape cloth, whatever you want to carry it. Real cheap. You should probably have thousands of feet of it at your farm because you need it for a million things. And uh, I'm not a fan of weeds, so I use it to control. I put that right on top of the gravel. And to cut that, just turn the pot upside down and just trace the bottom of it. And you don't need a template. You just trace the bottom of this. Pretty easy. Oh, no, that's the next step. Oh. Then I take the coconut husk and I put it on top. <clears throat> so you have a barrier between the gravel and the food scraps that pre prevent the food scraps from just becoming part of the gravel. And it eventually will anyway by the time the year's over. But you're, you're, you're still s giving it like a double s separation. I put the coir a little bit bigger in circles. So you can go a little bit maybe bigger in diameter, maybe an inch. So it goes up the sides a little bit. And uh, then I put the coir right on top of that. And that's it. Now, there are other things you can use besides coir. I can pass this around. These are just different types of performance. You could use char, right? <sighs> it's never been done, so I don't know. The bigger piece is too fine with clogged, but otherwise it, it, it breeds. It needs to be tested. I don't know. I can't, I can't address it. Right. it. It's never been done. This is just, you can almost step on this stuff. It's very, it's like a... If you don't have access to coir, and these are different types of just polymer drainage things, but the food would be on top of those. What that does is it keeps it off of the gravel area and keeps the liquids digesting through, but it also helps with aeration. Because a lot of this has to do with making sure there's oxygen on every part of the vertical column. That's the reason why you want to fluff and stir. It's also the reason why there needs to be sort of ability of oxygen to get down in the lower levels. If you don't, it starts to suffocate and smell. So you want to make sure that there is oxygenation. Now, people ask me what the bioconversion rate of is in the unit. It's about three pounds per square foot. Not cubic foot, per square foot. Think of it from surface eating only. Okay, so three pounds per square foot. So you can determine about how much. That's where you get the 20, 25 pounds. We based our units on bioconversion of just surface. The great thing is if you're good at fluffing and you're good at getting the oxygen down there through whatever scientific finesse you have, you're going to get higher levels of bioconversion. And that's good because you're maximizing the use of the pod. So if you can come up with ways to use it vertically rather than surface. So remember, our, our study is based conservatively on three pounds per square foot. But if you can get it to start eating in the whole vertical column, you're going to get higher performance levels, which is a great asset. So, so our numbers are based on conservative surface feeding. Got it? Yeah. Rule of thumb for, for aeration. Most of the aeration is done by them, which is great because that's what they would do at a, like a, a fallen deer in the woods. They would create ventilation channels by tunneling through, and the oxygen would get down into the center of the carcass. Because, you know, it's about out-competing other species. And that's the, the whole benefit of this, of this species is it's really good at winning. I mean, it, can, it beats the microbes in speed. That's amazing. Yeah. When that's really cooking, how full would that be? I'd say two-fifths, two-fifths to a half. I'm, mine never really gets deeper than maybe, I've never had it get deeper than three-fifths full. So. You can figure out the aeration, you could have it be full. Yeah, I don't discuss about aeration because that's our, our patented technology that's coming out next, is aeration things that allow us to have larger volumes. The reason these things don't work at huge volumes is because of aeration issues. That's why you say, oh, I built this 25-foot thing, but it smelled like... Blah, blah, blah. It's because the ventilation is, is problematic. So we're right now at our research facility working on that. So we'll hopefully have some breakthroughs in the next 18 months. So 
it should be exciting, but there is a lot about ventilation that um, is beneficial. So it's, it's, it's cutting edge stuff. Um, in regards to the desiccation issues and the house fly issues and the issues we had with new setups, do the exact same thing. Get some burlap, cover it, maybe double the burlap, and that will help keep the light down, help keep the moisture in, help keep the house flies out. Fruit flies are going to come no matter what, but they're cute, so it's okay. Um, except the bad one. Spot yeah, spot and uh, it's also going to provide egg laying spots. Uh, I would not cover these. A lot of people are like, well, why don't you have a lid? Why? why? Because it respires so much. This thing breathes and uses oxygen through its catabolism so much that if you put a lid on here, it's going to suffocate and go anaerobic. If for some reason you have to cover this, I would use some non-chemical plywood or something that maybe doesn't have a lot of leachate on it and put a couple two by fours and cut them and elevate it significantly so that ventilation can get in, but whatever reason is you're covering it is not getting in. I just, I try to stress to people, leave it open. All of our research units are open. If you have pest problems, get a screen and build a screen around it so that it, air can get in, but whatever can't get in. Pat, you probably don't have mongoose problems, so you don't need a lot of screen issues. What? Do you want? Uh, what? Oh, this is always set up in full shade, set up under cover. I'm so sorry I didn't bring that up. Yeah, this has a lid, so you could probably put it in an area where it, it could rain, but full shade, covered. Um, if you put this in the sun, it's going to overheat so much, and it'll just, it'll kill it. It's, it's too much. It'll go, it'll go over 120. And they're crawling out, you know. Yeah. Uh, I'll get 110 is when you see um, premature crawl off of the lighter color grubs and they start evacuating. Um, you will notice on a new setup that um, the grubs initially have a difficult time crawling off because it's clean. Once it gets yucked up, then they can grip better and they, they climb out easier. Also when it's moist, they climb out easier, so maybe spray it a little bit with some water. Or do what I do, and I tip it towards the hole about one or two degrees on new setups and I just elevate a little bit, usually with a branch or something, towards the hole. And that little bit of a bump helps with the new clean setup. Now, this whole thing gets gummed up, so they are able to grip pretty quick. But on new setups, there's a little bit of difficulty gripping. They don't tend to get out. You will get a little bit crawling out through the holes, and you will get some crawling out this way. That's fine. All you're doing is magnifying the local population. You want, you want them to be able to continue, so every single one that you grow shouldn't necessarily be for feed, um, but you want to magnify your population because escapees help with that. They come back and lay eggs. Some, yeah, sometimes I just take a handful and just whip them out so that they can reproduce. <laughs>